All right. Welcome to another macro discussion. This time around, we're going to travel across the Atlantic all the way to the good old continent of Europe. And spoiler alert, the European economy is on the verge of collapse. We're going to talk about the challenges that the European economy is going through, the status of inflation, and lastly, the approach by the monetary policy. But without further ado, here it is, in focus. Flash crash in European equities today, an ominous sign for a collapsing economy. You might have noticed overnight the flash crash in European equities. What happened? We got some confusing headlines. Perhaps it is the Norwegian stock market because Norwegian equities took a massive hit. And then we got the news that it's actually the Swedish stock market, the Stockholm benchmark, where the flash crash actually happened. But it was contagious to Norwegian equities and other European equities. So what happened here? We get a massive flash crash, and then they pretend that everything is just normal. They brush these flash crashes as, oh, fat finger trade. They played the same racket back in 2011 when we got the fat finger crash here, and we now know it was not a fat finger crash. There was something more sinister behind it. Perhaps this one is no different. While it was not immediately clear what caused the short-lived slump, a spokesman for the Nasdaq Stockholm said it was not a technical glitch on their part. Our first priority was to exclude technical issues in our systems. And our second priority was to exclude an external attack on our systems. We have now excluded both. And this is according to David Augustson, the spokesman for Nasdaq Stockholm. It is very clear to us that the cause of this move in the market is very substantial transaction made by a market participant. In other words, somebody took a massive dump adding that the Nasdaq will not cancel any trades made on the Nordic markets at all. Then we got the explanation that it was Citibank behind this massive dump. And they say, oh, it was just a misalignment because it was a low volume trading day in Stockholm. It was a misalignment with the Nasdaq here in the US, which caused the glitch and a massive sell-off. And uh, nothing is going on here. Please continue to play in the casino. Everything is okay. Wait till we get the real story behind this, that a large whale made a massive dump. Why would they dump right now? Now, something is about to happen. But here it is. It's not just the flash crash. It is more than that. European equities have been in the pain house for a while now. And European economies are falling apart as we speak right now. A massive exodus out of European equities. The Vanguard ETF is about to match the losses and the outflows that we've seen back in 2020 during the crash of the thing. And look at this. European stocks, the valuations at 16-year low when we pin them to U.S. equities. So is Europe the place to be right now? Equities are cheap over there. Perhaps it is a value trap. They're cheap for a reason. I'll explain to you that in a second. But the European continent is suffering from massive inflation. And this problem goes way back to 2020, when central banks decided to unleash the biggest wave of liquidity in human history, flooding global markets with trillions and trillions of dollars and euros. And this was the root of this inflation globally, not just in the US, but also in the EU. Inflation is now at 7.5% in the eurozone, the highest in decades. But of course, there was another shoe that dropped the double whammy in the European economy, and that is the war in Ukraine. Because European economies are highly dependent on Russian oil and gas. As you can see from the map, countries like Poland, Finland, Germany, Italy, France, they're dependent on Russian oil and gas, big time. If there is sanctioning against Russia, this will squeeze supplies, pushing prices even higher, and these economies will suffer more. And this is exactly what we've been seeing in the European continent right now. There is, of course, the looming threat that Russia could retaliate against the sanctions by cutting gas supplies to Germany and many other countries, and this will cripple European economies instantly. For now, Vladimir Putin is demanding payments in ruble for gas supplies to European countries. In return, these European countries are protesting these demands from Vladimir Putin because paying in rubles will defy the sanctions. And therefore, we saw the latest move by Putin of cutting gas supplies to both Poland and Bulgaria. Now, so far, this move will have limited impact, at least for now, on let's say the Polish economy, for reasons I'm going to explain to you in a minute, but it is a signal to the German economy that if Germany tries to play cute or not submit and pay in rubles, they could be next. If the German economy goes down, 
it will take down the entire European economy down with it. Here's an explanation of the gas situation between Russia and the EU from Sky News. And heads up, this guy is so proud of his graphics. And if I had the same graphics, I would be proud too. But here it is. Well, let's just start by reminding ourselves where Europe's gas, natural gas, actually comes from. Uh, and here you can see it uh, primarily from Russia. In fact, it kind of really sticks out there, doesn't it? Then Norway, then Algeria. But of that Russian gas, let's just kind of break down where that is going to. So we'll take that bar and what we'll do is we'll break it down among the different countries that are getting that gas. And there is, again, one that really sticks out here. It's Germany. Actually, let me put them kind of side by side so you can see just how big some of those slices are. Germany, by far and away, the biggest, then Italy, then Turkey, Netherlands, France and others. And it is within this, within this others category that Poland and Bulgaria are to be found. So not enormous, but still significant from their perspective. And what has actually happened here? Well, at the moment, those gas payments are going from Poland and Bulgaria to Russia in euros. And Russia has said, no, we don't want it in euros. We want it in rubles as well. That's the uh, symbol for the ruble. And Poland uh, and Bulgaria have said no. And essentially, that's what's caused uh, a bit of a rise in the gas price. So this is gas price uh, in the Netherlands. It went up by about 20 percent, which is, is big by the scheme of you know, previous years. But as you can see, we've had such a, a rocky ride recently in gas markets that that isn't that enormous. Why is it not that enormous? Well, it's partly because people are looking at Poland and they're looking at charts like this one. This shows you the amount of storage that they have in Poland, gas storage in previous years. You can see it goes down in the winter and then up in the spring and the summer. And look at where they are this year. So that's previous years. This year, you can see they've got a lot more gas in storage than in previous years. It's almost like they knew something was coming. It's worth also looking at the pipeline network that we have uh, around Europe. Of course, it's lots of pipes that are taking this gas mostly uh, from Russia into Europe. Um, and Poland at the moment, they're building new liquef liquefied natural gas terminals. Basically, it means that gas can be shipped in uh, via the coast. That means they don't rely on these pipelines quite as much. You've got in Bulgaria new pipelines coming in from Greece that are taking gas from Azerbaijan. So you're swapping Azerbaijani gas uh, for Russian gas. And then there's a kind of broader point, which is about these pipelines. You've got, let's just focus on two of them. This is the Nord Stream pipeline. It takes gas directly into Germany. You've got the Yamal Europe. It's a set of pipelines taking it from Russia into Poland. And have a look at the flows in that Polish, that Yamal set of pipelines. They've been really low recently. So Poland can kind of afford uh, with f having fewer gas coming out of Russia. But it's a different story when you look at the gas going into the Nord Stream pipeline, going into Germany. Germany massively reliant on Russian gas even now, which takes us back to where we started. This chart, what does Germany do now? Do they start paying in rubles? What about Italy? What about Turkey? The next few weeks are going to be very interesting indeed. So the Polish have been preparing for this, and good for them. They're going to absorb the blow for now. But the problem comes with the German economy. There's a lot of trouble in the German economy right now, relates to inflation, but more specifically, the Ukraine war and the dependency on Russian supplies of oil and gas. The German uh, Minister of Finance or Economy, whatever he is, he warned that Germany will go into a recession if there is an embargo against Russian energy products. Furthermore, we now know for sure, as a certain that the German economy will contract and perhaps fall into a recession if there is a Russian embargo. It's not just the German economists predicting that. It is across the board. Any embargo will cause the collapse of the German economy. And Germany remains reliant on imports for three quarters of its energy supplies. 26.7% of those come from natural gas. 31.8% come from oil. So the dependency is clear. And in the case of Germany, there is no other alternative to substitute entirely the dependency on Russian oil and gas. The minister also added that Germany must support Ukraine without endangering its own security. And this is a highly critical point. You see, Chancellor Scholz is in an extremely difficult position right now. He has, on one hand, the pressure from the United States to up their defense spending and to stand up against Russia by sending supplies to Ukraine and perhaps initiate more and more sanctions and embargoes against Russian products. On the other hand, they have the pressure from Russia that if they do that, Russia will cut gas supplies to Germany, which will result in the collapse of this economy. Another source of pressure is the internal politics in Germany. Inflation is sky high. The population at some point will start to ask the question, what is the end game here? How much pain do we have to endure for this war to be over? What is the objective of the United States from this war? Does the United States even have a plan to end this proxy war? What does a win mean? 
in this conflict because without these answers who knows how the situation will be escalated perhaps we will see the embargo perhaps we will see the abrupt cut off from the russian side and in either case the German economy will get destroyed in a massive way. Look at inflation in Germany, already above 7%. Inflation is sky high and it is moving to the highest levels since the 1990s. We talk about power prices. These are moving significantly higher, adding more pain to German households. We're also seeing used cars prices moving significantly higher in Germany. And now the standard of living is collapsing. When you have inflation moving higher, while the pace of economic output is stagnating, you have stagflation. The German economy is indeed in stagflation. We will look at the producer prices inflation, which is inflation that is in the pipelines, inflation that is about to come to the consumer in Germany. Well, this inflation is at the highest levels since 1949. And this is quite unbelievable. German annual producer price inflation topped 30% in March. The country's federal statistics office said on Wednesday that is the highest level since the agency began collecting data in 73 years. The German industry is on the brink right now. Shortages, costs moving significantly higher, and the pace of economic activity is slowing down while inflation continues to move higher with no stop in sight at all. Look at factory orders, for example. In Germany, factory orders are down 2.2% in February, and this could continue to go down. And hence, we see the stagflation crisis in that country intensifying. We now have projections that if commodity prices continue to move higher, and we continue to see more uncertainty, and the war prolonging in Ukraine. We could see the German GDP losing three points, three percent this year alone, specifically if there is any energy rationing. We'll look at different scenarios in the hit the German economy have to endure if we have energy rationing. In this case, inputs of energy declined by 40% in the period of three quarters from now. We could see the GDP going down by 1% in the mild scenario. And in an extreme scenario, we could see the GDP moving down 3% on this factor alone. So there could be other factors that could take the German GDP down from three points to five points, and perhaps even beyond that. Of course, Germany has no other choice but to continue to borrow even more. The net federal debt in 2021 was over 200 billion euros. The expectations for this year were about 100 billion euros, but now they have to add an additional 50 billion euros on top of that. And I say this is conservative for now. They might have to add another 100 billion euros on top of that. And look at the DAX the German stock market index, it maintains the bullish trend for now, but things are getting really scary. We have, this is the monthly chart, of course, we have negative divergence on the RSI, the MACD indicators. These momentum indicators are pointing out that the destination is downward from this point on. We are already past the distribution phase. We got the accumulation after the 2020 crash, and then we got the distribution in 2021, and now we're seeing the next phase, which is the liquidation phase. And if that happens, the DAX could go down from last month's closing another 14 to 15% all the way to the support of 12,000. And if that doesn't hold, the DAX could go down all the way in a retest of the 2020 crash lows, and that would be another 41% to the downside from last month closing. And if you thought that the German economy is bad right now, wait till you see the UK economy because the British economy is getting hit the hardest right now. The CPI is well above 6% in Britain. The GDP is barely at 2%. And this gap between GDP and CPI inflation is getting wider and wider and wider by the day, by the week, by the month. We continue to see inflation moving higher in that particular country for the same reasons, of course. You got inflation from the insane monetary policies, and then he got the war in Ukraine, shortening those supplies even more. And now they say that Q1 of this year will be positive, the GDP in Britain will be positive, and then Q2 might go down by a tiny bit. And I say watch out here. UK GDP could go down in ways you couldn't even imagine. Why? Because manufacturing prices are moving at the fastest rate since 1979. So we got inflation moving higher. What about the pace of economic activity? Because if you have both moving higher, you're still in the healthy phases of inflation. But if you got inflation moving higher, then the pace of economic activity is stagnating and slowing down. You got stagflation, and stagflation is the most destructive phenomenon to any economy, not just the British economy. Well, here it is, the PMIs for both services and manufacturing, well, they're pointing down. 
They're still positive, but it's just a matter of time before we see a massive slowdown in manufacturing and services in the UK. The British pound has been getting hammered, and now we're seeing the pound trading at the same levels of September of 2020. Soon enough, it's going to go below that, as we continue to see the US dollar moving higher and higher and higher. The BBC says people face the biggest drop in living standards in the UK since 1956. Matter of fact, the UK says about 43% of the population will struggle to pay energy bills. And now even Standard Bank is warning that there is a 50-50 chance of the UK falling into a recession. And I say make that 100%. When we look at consumer confidence in the UK, it's in the toilet, record lows, the consumer has no confidence at all as they continue to see prices moving higher and higher and higher with no stop in sight at all. The pace of the collapse in living standards in the UK is the fastest in eight years, the living standards in the United Kingdom falling fast. And if this continues, by the way, in 2020, we will see the biggest collapse in disposable income in the United Kingdom in at least 66 years. Yep. And of course, when you have consumer confidence in the toilet, record lows, and inflation moving significantly higher, wages are not keeping up with increase in inflation, UK consumers have to make different decisions. By the way, this could be a catalyst for the change of behavior we're about to see here in this country from the consumer. Look at this. The volume of sales in non-store retailing down 7.9%. And you wonder why Amazon went down? Auto fuel down 3.8%. All retailing down 1.4%. All sales besides fuel down 1.1%. And then you have food down 1.1%. Clothing and footwear down about a half a percentage point department stores pretty much flat and then you have the essentials non-food sales up 1.3 percent household goods 2.6 percent and other stores up 2.9 percent when you have a change in consumer behavior forced upon by inflation it is not going to be a good outcome here because who's going to stimulate the economy who's going to spend on goods and services restaurants traveling, etc. When the consumer have to make these choices of spending more on gasoline, petrol, in the supermarket, for example, they're not going to have enough disposable income after that to go out and stimulate the economy. And of course, when we look at the FTSE 100, UK equities, they're still cheap. When you pin it against other European equities and even the world index, global equities, UK equities remain extremely cheap. The problem is they're cheap for a reason. They're cheap because the country is under severe economic challenges and you cannot buy this value trap because that's what it really is until we start to see the light at the end of the tunnel. But for now, all we see is darkness because central banks are not leading. Central banks continue to be callous about the inflation problem. Central banks remain way behind the curve and therefore we're not seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. When we talk about France, another giant European economy, it's already under stagflation. French growth last quarter crashed to zero. Zero growth. And inflation continues to move higher. Hence, we have stagflation in France. What about Italy, another important European economy? Well, the Italian economy went down by 0.2%. Negative growth in Q1. Now, Italy is planning to tax profits on their energy firms and use that money and rotate it to other firms who have to endure the cost of energy inflation. A bad idea. You're punishing a company, energy companies in Italy, for what? It's not their fault. The price of energy in the global market, in the futures market, is dictating the pricing right now. Did Italy move profits from prosperous companies back in 2014 to the struggling energy companies? Of course not. So why do it now? Now, you could say that Italy fares a lot better than Germany, for example, because they have direct pipelines from Algeria, a massive natural gas producer. They also have direct pipelines all the way from Azerbaijan, another massive natural gas producer. The problem is, and I've been saying this about this inflation, for a long time. It's not a supply problem. The supply is ample. They can pump whatever gas they want from Azerbaijan, from Algeria, Qatar, US, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, they're going to pay the market price for natural gas. And if that price is higher, they're going to pay that price. It doesn't matter whether there is enough supply or not. Inflation has always, always been a monetary phenomenon. Central banks are going to print like crazy. You get inflation. Whether you have supplies or no supplies, that doesn't matter at all. You stimulate the demand out of whack, any supply system will collapse. Case in point, look at Norway. We'll talk about that in a second. Now, the Norwegian economy is doing a lot better than other European economies because they produce and export a lot of energy 
be it oil, be it gas, and therefore they fare a lot better than other European countries. Nonetheless, the Norwegian sovereign fund lost $74 billion in the last quarter alone. This is a massive loss, and if you have the sovereign fund losing this much, if these losses are sustained, they will be reflected negatively on the Norwegian economy. When we talk about energy prices, specifically power prices, electricity prices, we haven't seen prices this high in Norway in a long, long time. These are the highest prices the Norwegian household has to pay in years. And therefore, you're starting to see some backlash saying, hey, why do we have to export our products to Germany and the UK when we need this product here at home to push these prices down? Inflation is a problem for all households, not just in Norway, but across the globe. And that could feed, by the way, the populism and the nationalism of, hey, domestic policies first. We don't want the adventures globally and feeding other nations. You're already starting to see this here in the United States, the backlash. What about Spain, another important economy in the EU? The problem in Spain right now is this spat between Spain and Algeria. If there is a cutoff in supply from Algeria to Spain, then we will see a gap in supply. The Spanish have to find supplies somewhere else. Well, everybody's struggling, the Germans, the Italians, the French, everybody's struggling to find supplies of natural gas. And this imbalance will cause inflation in the short run. But again, the primary source of inflation in the long run is always monetary. So this is the perfect storm of inflation. But this intense amplification of inflation recently in the European continent is due to the war in Ukraine and the shortages of supplies, be it due to the war or the sanctions against Russia. In this case, the most important commodity for the European continent is natural gas. We're seeing the Russians already cutting natural gas. Yes, it is the only loophole in all these sanctions where natural gas is not sanctioned for now, but we could be headed that way either by a full embargo or a cutoff on the Russian side. What is the alternative, you might ask? Can the European continent just import gas from the US, or shall we say Qatar, or Algeria, or any other country, and forego Russian supplies altogether? Well, it's not that easy. Listen to this interview with Massimo Di Eduardo, who's the VP of gas and LNG research at Wood McKinsey. And heads up, I don't want to stop this video midway and annoy you, but notice how the interviewer keeps insisting over and over and over again. Blah, 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 blah. The guy explains that it's not easy to substitute these Russian supplies of gas, but she keeps going on and on and on. Is there another way? Is there th an alternative? Is there? Take a listen. If there was an oil or gas embargo tomorrow, and again, it's unclear that there's a million discussions on whether they can pay in ruble or not, what, how much um, energy does Europe have? have left? Well, not much, right? And yeah. it's very different between oil and gas, obviously. Yes. Um, so, so for gas, <clears throat> the issue that Europe has is that it cannot substitute all the Russian gas straight away. Right. So Massimo, if you're Italy today, if you're Germany today, the countries that are most dependent on Russian gas, what kind of calculations do you do? I mean, the politicians and the companies have a really difficult task to make. Very difficult task. And, and you can see how different countries have responded, how difficult that task is, right? So you've heard, you've heard yesterday, uh, OMV, so Austria and Germany, no. willing to effectively yes. abide to this new payment uh, approach. And Italy on the other side, taking its time to see whether there are options. But in reality, right, no. while again, probably Austria and Germany really don't have any other option to substitute that Russian gas, Italy might think it as it, but no. we don't think actually that that is going to be something that they can do, at least in the short term. There's nothing, there's not like, is there some kind of agreement with Qatar that they can do and get the gas quickly? Can the U.S. and some gas, are there strategic reserves and gas that they can release? It takes time. Europe is How much time? Well, Europe is important as much LNG as it can <laughs> at the moment, right? Okay. For new supply to get developed, it takes between four and five years, right? So until 2025, possibly 26, more LNG supply in Europe compared to what we're seeing now, it's very unlikely. So is there anything that, that these countries can do in the next five to six months? Well, uh, I mean, I'm afraid for some of these countries, if there is an embargo of Russian gas, the only way is to cut demand, right? And different countries would have different exposure. So we've done some analysis at, at a European level. If Russia was going to cut supply just now, we think that eventually up to 10% of industrial of national demand could be cut, right? Yeah, and of course, as opposed to COVID, this is something that is self-imposed by some of the governments. So what do you think they'll end up deciding? Will some of these companies, I mean, I know I think one of the Italian companies also set up an account to be able to yeah. pay in rubles. You know, again, I think I think what you will see it's really 
dependent on how countries and company can deal with that, without Russian gas. Again, you, Italy perhaps has a bit more leeway compared yeah. to Germany and Austria, at least at the moment. Uh, and so you might see some companies try and do something, right? Yeah. But again, Edison, for example, as a contract that expired at the end of this year, they might decide to give that away. But any still imports yeah. more than 20 yeah. BCM of gas from Russia, we think it's unlikely that they'll be able to do anything but just pay, uh, pay you know, go, go with these payments. So here it is. It's going to take years before the dependency of natural gas from Russia is completely substituted, if ever. And these European companies importing gas from Russia will have no other choice but to submit and pay for Russian gas supplies in rubles, which will defy the entire purpose of the sanctions. Why does it take so long, by the way, to ramp up natural gas supplies? Here's an explanation by the Wall Street Journal. And for American producers looking to supply more LNG overseas, it's no easy feat. That's because transporting natural gas is more complicated than oil or coal. After the gas is drilled from the ground, it's put through a pipeline. It's then sent to a plant that functions like a massive refrigerator, where it's chilled into a liquid state for shipping. That super refrigerator that turns it into a liquid, those are multi-billion dollar facilities. The ones that are running that we have built right now are running at full capacity. And building these super refrigerators could take years. Really the earliest that additional U.S. supplies could be put on the market to Europe or anywhere is 2025, 2026. As you can see, we're already sending a massive amount of ships full with LNG to the European continent, but it's not enough and it's never going to be enough. We have to build ships, massive ships, which will take years and years and years on top of the facilities that we need to build to ramp up this supply. This could take beyond 2025 to even substitute half of the Russian gas supplies to the European continent. Now, you might be a wise ass and say, ah, now you gave me an idea. If we have to build all of these ships, transport the LNG, should I invest in the companies making these ships? Perhaps. But a reminder, the top builders of these ships happen to be massive global conglomerates, such as Samsung and Hyundai. So yeah, cute attempt, but your choices are going to be limited here. And of course, just another note, now we have the EU warning Elon Musk that being too lax on Twitter moderation, meaning, meaning censorship, could get the platform banned in Europe. So here we go again. They want to censor and they want to take platforms out. This will cause more and more economic pain to the EU. But let's hear from the ECB, the European Central Bank's, uh, what is it? She's president or officer, whatever the hell she is, Madame Lagarde. Now, the question is, you have this massive inflation that we just talked about. So why isn't the ECB hiking up rates significantly higher right now? Madame Lagarde has a trick up her sleeve. Listen to this. Uh, we talk often about inflation in this country, but inflation is also at a record high in Europe. Um, the Federal Reserve Chair has talked about raising interest rates in this country next month by as much as half a percent to try to get control here. Why do you think you can wait until the summer? I believe that um, we share the same resolve, uh, which is to tame inflation, which is to use all the tools that we have to do so. But we are facing a different beast. When I look at my core inflation, which is inflation taking out the most volatile elements, such as energy and food, my core inflation is at 2.9%. Inflation in Europe is very high at the moment. 50% of that is related to energy prices. Pre Ukraine war, it was already climbing, but the Ukraine war has dramatically increased those prices. So we have to use the tools and the uh, sequence, mm -hmm. which is appropriate depending on the sources of inflation. If I raise interest rates today, it is not going to bring the price of energy down. So we have embarked on that journey of gradually removing accommodative uh, monetary policy. So we will be um, interrupting the purchases of assets in the course of the third quarter. High probability that we do so early in the third quarter. Mm -hmm. And then we will look at interest rates and how and by how much we hike them. But we have to be data dependent because of the sources of inflation that we have at the moment. Now, point number one, yes, increasing interest rates could or could not 
drop energy prices down for a simple reason. It doesn't matter what the ECB does. This is the little secret nobody wants you to know about. It's all about the Fed. It's all about the Federal Reserve. When America sneezes, the rest of the world will catch AIDS. The ECB can jack their interest rates right now. It might take a dent on inflation, but it's not going to be that significant without action in the Federal Reserve of the United States of America. You can look at it another way. If the Federal Reserve here in this country starts tightening the monetary policy, then we will see inflation getting hit globally. So is Madame Lagarde playing this cute game of saying, I'm not going to increase interest rates right now. I'm going to wait for the Fed to do that. And then I reap the benefits either way because inflation goes down when the Fed tightens their monetary policy. And I don't have to do anything at all. Here's the problem. Here's the catch. When we say when America sneezes, the rest of the world catches AIDS or cancer or whatever your favorite death, if the Federal Reserve increases interest rates dramatically to crush inflation, but in doing so, they also crush the economy by higher unemployment and stock and real estate market crashes, then the U.S. economy will go down. If the U.S. economy goes down, it is extremely unlikely to have the European economy doing just fine. It's going to go down with us. And here's the problem. Let's say Jerome Powell gets interest rates all the way to 2.5%, 3%, and that crashes the economy because the economy is so fragile and so dependent on the Fed's cocaine. When you take that cocaine, the economy falls apart. The stock market falls apart. But even if that happens, the Fed, in essence, bought ammo. Now they have 2.5 points, perhaps 3 points, that they can use in easing the monetary policy to re-stimulate the economy. On the other hand, the ECB will have no ammo at all. So it's a high-risk strategy by Lagarde. If it works for now, it could fire back later on. But here's the part where I agree with Madame Lagarde. Take a listen. You know, in this country, there's a lot of debate around um, how much the government is to blame versus the central bankers for the inflation that we're experiencing. The U.S. spent $6 trillion on COVID relief. Two trillion of it um, on President Biden's watch last spring when the economy was already recovering. Do you think some of this spending in the U.S. exacerbated inflation? Because Europe didn't spend like this. We spent, we in Europe spent less in stimulus, and I think we spent differently. Uh, we spent pretty much half as much as what the U.S. government spent on stimulus and heating up the economy. But we also spent it differently because I think the focus was predominantly on keeping the jobs, not necessarily sending the checks. And as a result of that, um, people who managed to keep their jobs alive, while not necessarily you know, going to work because COVID stopped everybody from going to work at some point in time, they had their job. So when COVID was over, they went back to their job. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, 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 the labor market that you have currently in this country, in the US, which is incredibly uh, tense, where you have you know, a lot of jobs that are not uh, filled, where you have plenty of vacancies, we don't have that in Europe at the moment. And the current situation you have on the labor market here in the US is clearly contributing to possible uh, strong inflation and second round effect where prices go up, wages go up, short supply of labor, wages continue to go up, and that feeds back into prices. That, that's one of the differences between our two economies. Now, this is true because the ECB did not print as much cocaine as the Fed did. The Fed overdone it. The Europeans had better measurements. For example, they had unemployment insurance. People did not get evicted. They did not lose their jobs. They did not lose access to health care. Small businesses fared a lot better than this country. On the other hand, here in the United States, we've overdone it with the trillions and trillions of dollars. The biggest tsunami of liquidity in human history. And we still got unemployment. We still got small businesses disappearing across the country. Complete crash. And we still got evictions. And we still have an economy that is so fragile and dependent on liquidity, even after the trillions that have already been poured into this economy in the stock market. The question is, where did the money go? The simple answer is, how about the stock market? How about corruption? How about fraud? Because that's what really happened here. Trillions of dollars borrowed from the future of this country flushed down the toilet and fraud and corruption and wasting money all over the place. So the European did a lot better in managing the release of liquidity, but they've still overdone it relatively so. 
because European economies are smaller than the United States. In either case, whether Lagarde tightens right now or later or perhaps never, it is a lose-lose game. If she tightens now, the European economy crashes. If she doesn't tighten at all, and plays the game of waiting for the Fed to act. Meanwhile, she keeps the data-driven approach, and the data suggests that she's way behind the curve, by the way, but regardless, the ECB and European economies will lose too, because when the recession happens, the ECB will be out of ammo, and this is a major problem. Let me know what you think in the comments. Is Lagarde indeed playing this game, waiting for the Fed to act first, and then she sees and assesses whether she needs to act or not? Let me know. And folks, this is all I got for you for now, for this video. But stick around, the technical analysis for the stock market is coming later this evening. Thank you for listening, thank you for watching. You'll hear from me again soon.